afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you don't recall me from previous uh, TCL conferences, uh, Jonathan Cohn, I'm, I'm with FlightAware, I'm a senior software developer on our, our backend team, which is responsible for feed ingestion, commercial APIs, and some other miscellaneous software that we use at FlightAware and tooling. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about this thing called Daylight and an extension to it, Simdex. It's a way that we're now storing some of our raw flight data using uh, SQLite. Um, so we'll go over a little bit of, of how this came to be, uh, why we created this technology, a little bit of overview on the how the surface itself works, uh, talk about this, this thing called Simdex, some of the original rationale for it, and uh, maybe some of the uh, incorrect assumptions, but that went into it. Um, some client processing side uh, of the uh, service itself, overall performance and development pains, and, and then take y'all's questions. So Daylight started off, y'all all know Carl, he kicked off the conference for us today. Uh, this was something he dreamt up probably one weekend. Um, but he, we have these huge files of raw data streams that are just stored as, as TSV files that are key value lines. So for example, one of these feeds is combiner. It's, it's just a, a merged version of all our input feeds. And for each one of these, you're gonna see some, they all start with some, some sort of clock values and an epoch and a, a sequence for that and then various key value data. So we repeat keys through, throughout each line uh, basically, that allows us to be pretty flexible. We're not stuck with any particular format for, for a given feed um, along the way. Um, but we also have, so we have these big uh, files of data. Um, one of the things that we do have a need to do, so we have a decision engine called Hyperfeed, and it's the thing that's ingesting all of this raw data, and then ultimately deciding, well, this position goes with this, this flight, this flight plan goes with this flight, oh, you know, we need to split this flight because this data needs to be viewed by users have, that have this permission. And, and uh, you know, here's, here's the view of data for people who are just, you know, the public at large. Um, and, and we need to go back periodically and simulate those flights with Hyperfeed because we'll get, you know, requests from customers and they want to know, uh, why didn't I see these messages for this flight? Um, so we have something called sim runs, which we use to do that. Um, the data for those simulations, we've been generating using just grips of these TSV files. So we would grep looking for certain keys and, and pulling their values to see if they matched whatever identif aircraft identifiers we're looking for. Um, but, you know, these files are, you know, if we go back to January, they're a little bit smaller now, 90 gigabytes a day or so. Um, grepping them, even, even somewhat doing that in parallel, uh, still took a substantial amount of time. Um, so customer service might you know, be waiting a couple of hours uh, to see the results of one of those uh, simulations. So we, Carl had had the idea, like maybe we could store this uh, data in SQLite, put some clever indexes on it and, and, and get access to that data a little faster. Um, and then that would then become the, the source of data for Hyperfeed sim runs. Um, one of the things we also didn't necessarily want to have another copy of these, you know, tens to hundreds of gigabyte size files. Uh, so we did purchase the uh, ZipFS uh, extension for SQLite and make use of that. And then maybe we find some other opportunities to, to query this data in interesting ways and, and use it as inputs for analysis or other programs. So uh, just one quick aside, if you're wondering about the name itself. So day, all of our source files, we create one file per day. So we'll do, we do the same thing with these SQLite files. One, one SQLite file per day per stream and then stealing the light off SQLite. Uh, little timeline of this, the, the project actually started back in March of 2019 with Carl's first commits. At that point, it's an entirely a TCL implementation for these two core programs. Uh, we'll talk a little more in a second, but one's the TSV to SQLite schema and the other one that does the TSV to, to, to the SQLite ingestion. Um, we, while that worked well, we were, we, there were some performance issues with the TCL implementation at that point. And uh, Carl ultimately switched over to using C++ and rewrote those programs, uh, allowed him to, to take advantage of some other C++ tooling we have for, sort of, for high-speed access to some of these data streams. Um, we, we move on into July of 2019. We have our first kind of experimental run with the Sims. Um, 
generally went well, but we, there, we still had some stability issues with the service itself. So in August, uh, we just stopped, stopped the experimental sim runs while we continued to, to do some more work on, on daylight itself uh, and increase the stability uh, of the service, make it a little more mature. Uh, Carl then had another idea in September of 2019, so a little over a year ago, to create something called Simdexer. This was originally a program that would read these same TSV lines and there are sets of keys that we're looking for. So we would look at and see, do you have these keys? And if so, what's the value? And all right, I'll start building file offsets uh, for the keys that match up with that. And then you would use the Simdex file, you would query it and say, hey, tell me all the file offsets for some aircraft identifier, Southwest 35. It would tell you all the file offsets and then you could go to NFS and just do a bunch of F read, F, uh, F seeks to, to get those lines in a, in a faster way. Um, we, one of the stability issues we had with it was we, we used to run the ingestion as just a cron. Uh, we switched around to running that as a service. So basically it's, it's just a TCL process. It's waking up every now, now and again and seeing, hey, is my next day's file available? Um, and it does some watchdogging, things like that. Uh, and then May of this year, uh, we had re reimagined the Simdexer program as well as the enhancements for daylight. Um, same sort of concept, we would we'd still keep track. We would uh, analyze the data as it comes in, but instead of storing file offsets, we store row, idea, row IDs. Uh, that largely came about because the NFS files themselves would sometimes be slow. And uh, there could be issues with, uh, you know, getting the data just because someone else was doing a lot of reading or, or writing into those boxes. And then we come in today and, and, and basically we're in a maintenance mode, continue to make some small improvements. We re recently released a couple of command line tools for developers to use to kind of quickly get at that data without having to, to write um, TCL scripts to, to access the interface. So let's take a look at sort of the overview of how this works and the sort of collection of programs that are, are daylight. So our our, our first one that's really kicking everything off, this is just a TCL service called ingest, we call ingest generator. Uh, that's what I, I mentioned, this is doing end of day processing. So it's waking up periodically, is our new file there? If so, it'll uh, launch TSV to schema where we'll pass through our day stream and the day stream is just what, what we call these TSV files. Using a little bit of uh, the C++ uh, program called copy stream, it's just high speed access to these day stream files. Um, gets ingested in here. At this point in TSV to schema, we're just looking at every key in the, uh, in, in, in for each line inside of the uh, day stream. And we're inspecting the contents of it so we can determine the appropriate SQLite type for the column we're gonna build for that key. And as the result of all of this, uh, it's also gonna find any instances where there's a key name that's not a valid SQLite column, and that happens with some degree of frequency and it'll spit out a uh, schema file. And we'll look at in a minute about what the daylight table or database itself looks like. Then we do a second pass. We now will launch uh, TSV to SQLite. Again, we're gonna ingest all the data again. We now have created our, our SQLite table. And all we're doing at this point basically is the, the inserts and arriving at a uh, final this compressed SQLite file that we call daylight. Um, as part of the work for uh, using this for sim runs, customers will, will call us and, and they may be calling about a flight that's happening today. So just having this available for end of day wasn't quite good enough. Ideally, we would be able to look at live data as well. So we made a little bit of adjustments to, to how this works. We, when we're doing live processing, um, we, we don't actually invoke TSV to schema. I mean, we arguably did it once to arrive at the very first uh, schema. But after that, um, when TSV to SQLite starting up, it's, it's pulling the uh, schema from yesterday's file and creating our SQLite table based on that. As it sees data coming in, it's inspecting all the columns in each line and it's saying, hey, you know, do I have a, does this column exist in, in our SQLite schema? If not, I'll go ahead and add it. Uh, when it adds it, it's just going to, to look at the data type for the value that was on that key in its first pass, set the column type based on that. Uh, but it also will keep track of Oh, uh, any changes, you know, let's say it saw a value, thought it was an integer later on, turns out it's not really an integer. Someone's got a, you know, textile uh, format in here. Uh, it'll keep track of that and know that, that ultimately that should have been a text, um, uh, text column. Uh, 
And so at the end of the day, what it'll do is um, when it gets there, it'll say, hey, were any of the columns that I had to add, are the ultimate data types, is there any instance where they didn't match our, our, our first guess? If so, uh, it'll then just recreate the table since, since we can't alter uh, a column's definition in SQLite. Um, so we'll just follow the, the recipe basically prescribed in the SQLite docs and uh, create a copy of that a table with the updated schema, move our data in, and then move our, 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 our temp new table in to replace the existing one, as well as, as do the compression uh, for that file. And then we'll write out a, uh, a schema file for that day. Um, and when we write the schema file out, we do strip anything that wasn't used for the previous day. Um, you know, sometimes there may be some column that, you know, from a feed, maybe we're not ingesting anymore or they don't produce that data. So we don't hold that column in perpetuity because we already have a lot of columns. So we don't need to hold on to extras for forever. Um, okay, so the, uh, the Simdexer itself, how this works, um, it's running alongside that TSV to SQLite program, or you can you can run it after the fact. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it's gonna look at each column uh, of, of data as it arrives. It's got a, a specific list of column names it's looking for, and it'll see, are those you know contained in this line? And then what's the value in them? And then it takes those values and we'll start building list of row IDs based off of them. Um, and the table that it's populating, it's, it's pretty simple. It's a primary key uh, for the idents and then just a list of, of row ID matches that are just aggregated with uh, commas and hex encoded to save a little space. I mean, it's essentially an out of band index. Uh, I've kind of listed the, the keys here. There's not a ton of them and it, it's, it's pretty static. Um, we also will look at hex ID a little bit differently uh, just to prevent any sort of conflicts and allow us to query that in a, a, a a way that makes it clear exactly what you're looking for on the, on the client side of things. So the, the daylight database structure then, when you, if you open one of these SQLite files in the end, you'll have one table that's named uh, based on whatever the feed was. So for example, combiner is the one we use for, for sim runs. That's that raw input coming into hyperfeed. So we'll have one table that called combiner. It's got all of those uh, columns with the sanitized names and, and the raw data itself. Uh, there'll be a, uh, whatever the feed name was, column map. So I, I mentioned that sometimes the key names aren't gonna be valid SQLite, uh, valid SQLite column names. So what we do in that case is we, we have a little bit of logic in there and we generally replace invalid stuff with uh, underscores. Got a couple examples here, you know, tmi.fcaid becomes TMI underscore FCA ID. And this, this column map table will, will have that mapping. There's also instances where uh, in this case, there was probably a timestamp that was all lowercase as well as this uh, timestamp that was um, not quite snake case because it's capital. Um, so in these case where we find duplicates, because obviously we don't, I really want uh, duplicate column names, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll append the underscore on there. Um, and then there's a work in progress table in the instances where we do this live. I mentioned that we, we keep track of, of the type that we first infer uh, for a new column we're adding and maybe what it might, and what it is at the conclusion. This work in progress table is where we track that. The reason for not just holding that in memory is, you know, obviously we occasionally are making updates to the service. We wanna release a new version of it. So we need some way to restart uh, the, the service and have it pick up from where it left off. So if we were just holding this in memory, you'd effectively lose all this information unless you wanted to go rescan or you know restart from the beginning of the day. Um, so we store it in this work in progress. And when it starts up, it looks at this table to figure out well what state it was in um, prior to shutdown. And then finally, this uh, Simdexer table, which has those aircraft identifiers to row ID mappings. So quick look at, at what Simdexer is doing here. So we can imagine we have a couple of lines. Uh, so these are, you know, combiner lines that are entirely fictional. Uh, somebody's flying along, they have an aircraft identification of, of FWRs is FlightAware's call sign, FlightAware 79, and their tail number is 1953 Golf. And let's say in this same file, we had a second one where for whatever reason, this source didn't have the tail number, but they did have the identifier. So the row IDs, and you might wonder, why are these row IDs so ridiculously tall? Um, this is also the, the primary key for the, the table. Uh, 
Um, I'll talk about that in, in, in a second, but uh, needless to say, we wanted row, we wanted the index, uh, row IDs to be unique even amongst uh, daylight, uh, daylight databases. Um, so that's why they're so huge. Uh, anyway, we just strip off the base. So there's some huge number it's starting at. We get rid of that for the row ID offsets and just encode the remainder. And we end up with a simple little table here that gives you the identifier and your listing of, of row IDs. So pretty simple. The, the client side of this um, is actually written in, in TCL. Um, we're running Apache. So there's a, an HTTP uh, Apache Rivet endpoint on uh, each one of the servers. In this case, we've got two data centers. So we have two servers that are storing this data and they have, I don't know, in the many terabytes of, of storage space available. Uh, on the server side, the TCL client code uh, is being used to query the SQLite databases themselves for response. So for multiple days, um, the way we, we, we do that is we'll, we'll just basically open each database file and marshal those responses uh, doing the same query. It's the equivalent of what we're doing in union all. Uh, Carl in the early days had, had played around a bit with using uh, the virtual tables to join the database files into a single table. Uh, he, he found that I think that the indexes didn't perform particularly well in, in that situation. The queries were, were not, uh, not very performant. Um, it turned out though that it really wasn't an issue because uh, it's, it's not typically very, uh, it's, it's not a typical use case where you're gonna need to join uh, against days in, in some way that, that it couldn't, we couldn't do it just one at a time in the way we're doing it now. Because you imagine most, most of the prior use, case, use cases were grepping and just you know taking that raw input and then in, ingesting it into some other programs. So, so doing the one at a time works fine. Uh, there's probably some benefits, but at the moment it does that all serially. So if you're asking for five days, it'll do the first, then the second, then the third, and the fourth, the fifth. We probably could query SQLite all at the same time there. Um, there's really no need you know, to be doing it one at a time, but we just haven't implemented that yet. Uh, it'll then look at the TSV maps, uh, which were those, the column map that I, I mentioned before, see if we've got to rename any column names so we can get back to the original TSV names because we ultimately want to arrive at lines that match roughly what our raw input is. The ordering of the columns might be different, but that, that's not relevant for the way we use the data. Um, and then in the case where someone does these SIMDEX queries, we actually first looked at the SIMDEX or table to look up the row IDs and then use that uh, to query daylight. So, you can imagine the, the, the data flow here is someone makes an HTTP request in for the data. And uh, on the other side of this, we do have some TCL uh, code that allows people to either command line or, or build a little interface that'll do the request for them so they don't have to know exactly what this looks like. But this request will come in on the server. Apache Rivet uh, handles that on the appropriate endpoint. We'll assume for a second that we're doing one of these uh, SIMDEX queries. So we've, we look at the SIMDEX table to get our row IDs, come back to the daylight table uh, to get the, the results from that based on the row IDs and ultimately produce a, a response back to, back to our client. So talking about the rationale for some of this. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we wanted to produce this simulated flight input and we need to inspect a whole bunch of columns in, for a given ident to do this. Not only that, we're most likely looking for multiple idents because we might we might look for some combination of, you know, two or three aircraft identifiers plus plus a tail. Um, we could do that using just you know simple OR operations. We could imagine you know select star from combiner where uh, ident equals something or reg equals something, and do that you know continue to OR on, and it works reasonably well. You know SQLite will use the multi-index OR search uh, for doing that. Um, one sort of kink in that though, is the way the daylight files were generated. We don't always have the, uh, uh, the columns might not exist. Some of those keys are, are, are not as prevalent as others. So they may not even exist in a database file. Um, so you would either have to inspect the SQLite master tables to, you know, find out, Hey, is this column exist here and, and, and which ones, which probably not a terribly expensive operation or ensure that you know, we were always uh, including these columns, even if they you know, just contain nulls. Um, we've, I've found that the performance on, on both you know, doing an OR or a union, which is something we do in some places as opposed to ORs, uh, a little bit slower than the SIMDEX solution. Um, 
I'll get to the, the ultimate reason we use Simdex is, is maybe based on a misconception and I'll, I'll address that in just a second. But, uh, you know, what we needed here was some high speed index and ideally we could just look at the one index that would hit all the columns of interest. That was the, the driving idea behind this. Um, one of the mistakes, uh, you know, I made, I don't know if Carl made the same error as well uh, and actually discovered while I was preparing for this presentation is SQLite is a lot faster than say Postgres for doing inserts on an indexed uh, table. Um, I, I had assumed that we couldn't, and if you look at the code right now, we actually don't, when we're doing these live generations or even generating the end of day, we don't apply the indexes until the end. Um, I think that was based on an assumption that that would, uh, there'd be a significant penalty to doing that. I, I went reading a little bit more on SQLite, discovered that some, some metrics Richard had posted on uh, performance for SQLite with index tables. Uh, that looked pretty promising and went and reran a bunch of uh, daylight files uh, over the last few days to see what the performance would be like if we if we did define the uh, indexes at the time of creating the tables and uh, it turns out yeah there's not a big difference between that and the way we're doing it before i mean it comes down to you know minutes uh, and given that it takes a couple hours two and a half three hours to generate these files uh, it's pretty trivial um, I still think, and the, the other thing that kind of led to this was the evolutionary nature of it. Um, as I mentioned, the, the original version of Simdex was, was for file offsets pointing to you know, the original NFS files. So it was a pretty easy step to go from that to row IDs and reuse a lot of the infrastructure that was there for Simdex or would just point at something new. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad place we ended up in, but uh, it's, it's not the, the, the case of, of having the indexes isn't as bad as I, I might've guessed it would have been. And it, the ultimate interface for it is pretty simple and it, it's uh, pretty easy to understand when you're looking at the, the underlying table data. And I did pull a little bit of, these are pulling some flights that I, I did uh, some analysis on on query time. We, we can think of the Simdex queries as being the combination of these, right? Because we have to do two queries. One is that Simdex query, which is very fast because we're only ever going to get, you know, however many items we've asked back rows. So if we're asking for three, we get three. In this case, I, I'm just comparing queries for a single ident. And then there's the work to actually uh, go and pull the data out. And we see that, you know, doing this with an or, I was a little surprised the union consistently seemed to be a little bit slower. Um, I had also played around um, something that Carl had run into. In, in, in my use case, it wasn't uh, as significant. Uh, but but they had run into instances where they had a daylight file. It had some number of indexes applied. They would add a new index and suddenly things would slow down significantly um, until they actually went back and ran analyze on it. And it makes some sense. Basically, you know, SQLite it, it, before running analyze, the query planner was making some bad decisions because it didn't have a full picture of the, you know, cardinality of those indexes to the query it was trying to perform. So uh, as Carl, or as Richard mentioned, um, be sure to run analyze periodically. Uh, we do it currently at the end of the day, just because of the, the time required to, to run analyze and a, you know, a lack of desire to necessarily fall behind real time in, in the live generation example. Uh, I just, again, while, while getting ready for this presentation and, and Richard talked about it in his talk, the, uh, the limit, setting the limit on analyze, that, that new feature is pretty interesting. And I think it's something we'll try out with this service to, to periodically uh, be performing that as well. Um, and then finally, just talk about some bumps in the road that I've maybe not addressed already. Um, I talked a little bit already, the, the first version of Daylight, the adding the new indexes slowing down. Carl spent a bunch of time playing around with uh, Analyze and, and understanding how it was determining the cardinality of these indexes to ultimately arrive at, at when and how we're, we're running Analyze when generating this data and, and querying it. Um, and then the first version, you know, didn't address the, the need to have data uh, for, for live sim runs. So that was something that needed to be addressed since we weren't going to know all of the, you know, we wouldn't know the full uh, table definition at the time we, we start processing like we do in our end of days. Um, you know, when we, when we write these end of days, we'll, we'll write directly to a compressed SQLite file. You, you can't support wall mode. Um, unless it's changed, and I hadn't noticed it in when you're using the uh, ZipFS uh, mode for SQLite. So when running in, in journal mode, I mean, it's not that surprising uh, because we're pretty actively writing to the database. It's hard for readers to get in and, and do anything. You know, most, most of the queries then will just return that the database was locked. Uh, 
Um, so for, for the live mode, we actually will write to just an uncompressed SQLite file that's running in wall mode uh, so that we can, you know, readers can be getting in there and doing lots, lots of activity, even while the writer is, is, is doing a lot as well. And, and then at the end of the day, we will just fork that TSV to SQLite process. Well, we close out all the connections and fork our process over, reopen in the child the connection, uh, do any of that cleanup I talked about before in terms of table column redefinitions, and then compress uh, the SQLite file uh, at the end there. Um, and then one of the downsides to our approach to, to using Simdexer is we have a fixed number of columns, right? So if I want to, uh, Richard talked about the benefits of, you know, something's not performing well, I can just go in and say create index and, and I don't have to do anything. The application performs better. And for whatever reason we did, Need to add some some key column along the way, and th this was an issue with the, the first version of Simdex we generated. We were missing one of the keys. Um, you have to go back and, and pay the price to go recreate all of Simdex uh, versus that adding just another index. So there's trade offs to it. Um, it's it's not a solution I would use everywhere. It, it works fine in, in this instance, though, and uh, we've been pretty happy with it. I I didn't mention it, but. Uh, you know, our, the, the time it takes now for us to simulate these flights, especially for these bigger ones where it's an active ident, you know, running and we're looking at three days of data has gone from hours to, you know, just a matter of minutes. Uh, so it's been a big return on investment on that for, uh, for a lot of the users at FlightAware internal, admittedly. So that's about it um, that I have to say, and we can open it now for anybody's uh, questions. Let me pull up the Q and A window. Uh, yeah, Ron. So it was the the reason for wanting to combine the row IDs into one one record was combination of performance. It, it doesn't take very long. So you know the biggest, most active flights will, will probably have let's say you know five to six thousand you know lines of, of individual data for a given day. Um, the amount of time, it, even in TCL, it takes to, to do the hex decode and, and, and split that, that string out is, it's, an, it's a tiny amount, it's microseconds. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we could have arguably done one gigantic, you know, had a, just a, a, a number, it also, like, excuse me, a number of, of uh, you know, a separate entry, just one row ID each. Um, I think it was the, you know, the original idea was it was kind of based on, on the way the Simdex version, which it did the same thing of, of aggregating together. I, I doubt that it would make a huge performance difference if we had done a, a, a separate uh, line for each, or a, you know, a separate entry for each row ID. We just wouldn't have that unique constraint anymore on the, um, on the actual key for that table. Um, Oh, so Matsumo was asking if we run an Apache instance for each daylight file. Uh, is it a whole standalone HTTPD server running? Um, so we don't run one Apache instance per daylight file. So daylight's actually running, it's running as a containerized service on uh, two servers. They're, they're both running the same things. One's just in Houston and one's in Dallas. There's a single Apache instance that, that's running inside of that container. And that, that container, that Apache instance, then when someone requests something, it will go and say, well, you're asking for data on, you know, November 5th, 6th, and 7th. It'll then open uh, SQLite, you know, it'll open the SQLite database files that are residing on those servers for the 6th, 7th, and 8th, execute its queries and, and push the, uh, the results across, um, you know, the response. 